Hello, I have with me Farhat, who is a senior analyst with the Dhaka-based Center for Research and Information. It's a political think tank which is affiliated to the Awami League. Hello Farhad, welcome to Strategic News International. Could we begin with asking you about the think tank? How did this come about and for how long has it been around? Thank you um, for having me. Um, Center for Research and Information was first uh, formulated and put in place in 2001. And at first it had a completely political research focus. But then during the last government of uh, the Bangladesh Nationalist Party, BNP, in 2004, it was shut down because the organization was doing a lot of reporting on the corruption, the attacks on minorities during that time. So the government shut us down during that period. It was then revived again in 2013 uh, with a particular focus, of course, on political research, but also a very particular emphasis on youth of Bangladesh. Mm -hmm. Bangladesh is a very young country and its population is also very overwhelmingly young. So about half of our population would fall under the uh, umbrella of what we call youth. So we figured that as a research organization, forward-looking, which has a particular focus on the future of Bangladesh, uh, we must uh, emphasize on the uh, uh, youth of Bangladesh. Uh, you were mentioning to me that Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina's son, Sajib Wajid, is involved with this think tank. In what manner is he involved with this? He's the chairman of the uh, Board of Trustees of Center for Research and Information. As you know, he is also the Prime Minister's Information and Communications Technology Advisor. In Bangladesh's political spectrum, he's quite a young leader himself and is looked upon by the uh, youth community in Bangladesh. Uh, principally because of his um, work in building the digital Bangladesh. So this was one of the pledges made by the Awami League back in 2009 uh, when it uh, came to power for the second time. And one of the main electoral pledges at that time was building a digital Bangladesh. So before you have digital India, you had digital Bangladesh. So the, the idea was to transform Bangladesh into a technologically advanced nation and Shaji Bajit was the driving force behind that electoral pledge and its su successful implementation over the last 10 years. Does he himself have any political ambitions? Well, he has been helping the party. Um, he has been offered leadership positions within the party by the party leaders for quite some time. I remember being present in the 2016 party council when the party, senior leaders of the party of uh, Bangladesh Aum League wanted to offer him a position of a central, uh, centrally a very important position within the party, but he refused. He, I remember him specifically making the comment publicly that do not make me Tariq Rahman. So you know about the other um, political family in Bangladesh, uh, Khaleda Zia. Her son Tariq Rahman, when her mother was in power, when his mother was in power, uh, got a very senior level position within the party uh, just because he, he was the son of the prime minister. And uh, Shajib Wajid wanted to draw a distinction between himself and Tariq Rahman by not taking that opportunity. So what he always says is that I'm happy helping the party and the government build a digital Bangladesh because that is my area of expertise. He wants to help the party win the next election or any other kind of electoral fight. Uh, he, he advises the party on strategic issues, but he, he doesn't have the uh, inclination to take up any leadership position as of right. So he, he's happy helping the party in whatever capacity he's currently in. So it's unlikely that he'll be contesting the elections in Bangladesh next month? That is um, unlikely at this moment, but uh, it, it, it is something that the supporters and the workers and leaders of the party really want him to do. What is his mother's thinking on this issue? Has she ever said anything about her son succeeding her? as uh, the leader of Awami League? Uh, she has not made any such statements. And I think the, the um, overwhelming uh, consensus within the family mm -hmm. is that there should be um, a gradual process of leadership. And uh, Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina, as you know, is also the leader of the Awami League mm -hmm. since she returned to Bangladesh from forced exile in 1981 when she returned from Delhi. Yes. So um, she, she has built this party through a lot of labor and love. Um, she has faced a lot of threats to her life. Mm -hmm. 
she got killed almost uh, not more, more than once and um, uh, even within the party's leadership issue she she really likes to um, ask people to give their labor to the party as she has done so it, it, i don't think it's ever going to be a very automatic issue for anyone and what are her party's poll prospects next month um, she's returning to power uh, that's as a, as a, as a supporter of bangladesh awami league uh, as someone who has uh, um, worked with the party, advised the party, I would say the prospects are very good. If you look at the opinion polls that have been carried out over the last one year, in fact, if you look at all the opinion polls carried out over the last five years by such organizations as the Democracy International from Washington or the International Republican Institute, so these are all internationally reputed, uh, new, new, neutral and independent organizations. All of these polls suggest that the people think that the country is moving in the right direction under Sheikh Hasina's leadership. Mm -hmm. The party has a much more favorable rating among the people than its competitors. And Sheikh Hasina as personally is looked upon as a very strong leader who has delivered on her promises of development. Um, she has um, done some tremendous feat of developments over the 10 years. You can talk about the poverty, which have millions have been lifted out of poverty. Uh, hundreds of millions of people have been given electricity connections where Bangladesh used to have a very big problem of load shedding. Mm -hmm. Now around 90% of the population have been brought under electricity coverage. So you have a, a sustained economic growth for the last three years. We have been uh, experiences economic growth for, for over 7%. Uh, last year, uh, last financial year, it was 7. Point, um, I think 7.3 or 7.4 percent, which is the highest ever. I, sorry, I think it was 7.6 percent, which is the highest ever in Bangladesh's history. So on the economic front, on the social front, Bangladesh has done extremely good in, in, in empowering women. Mm -hmm. it, is, it is stated as one of the uh, success stories in women empowerment. Uh, it has done very good in water sanitation issues. Uh, just today in our conference, we were discussing how Bangladesh has transformed itself into a role model for disaster risk reduction and disaster management. So if you look at all major indicators of the economy, society and human development, you would see the country has fared very well over the last 10 years. So if the electorate know what is best for them, I think the votes for Awami League would be uh, overwhelmingly more than any of their competitor. But of course, there is always an issue of uncertainty in any elections, and that remains to be seen. Could you share with us how Sheikh Hasina has dealt with growing radicalization and extremism in her country? Um, as a political leader, Sheikh Hasina has always been very much anti-extremism. Mm -hmm. She's a very pious woman uh, herself, though, but she has always been this role model for a Sunni Muslim country like Bangladesh, where you have a leader who is very pious in her personal life, but very secular in her political ideology. So you have a pious uh, Muslim woman uh, who has been leading the country for so many years. And even when she has not been leading the country, even as a political opposition leader, she has always taken a very strong stance against terrorism and extremism. Over the last 10 years, Bangladesh has been able to do something which many of us had written, uh, many of us had written off. So between 2001 to 2006, you had the rise and proliferation of some very deadly terrorist organizations like the Jamaatul Mujahideen Bangladesh. You had the Harkatul Jihad al Islami Bangladesh. You also had Bangladesh uh, soil becoming a safe haven for separatist groups which created havoc in the northeastern states of India. In the last 10 years, none of that is happening. Mm -hmm. But the fight has been difficult. Sheikh Hasina has paid a personal price for it. She has always been a target of these extremist groups because of her bold stance. But she has never uh, relented in her pursuit to make Bangladesh a non-communal country. And right now, we, we do have some newer forms of threat. So for example, you have this ISIS-inspired new groups like the Neo JMB, who have a much more violent vision of the world than, the, than their predecessors. So you know, indiscriminate killing of civilians, for example, is something that we had not seen among the terrorist groups in the past, who had more targeted and more focused approach in their work. Now it's just causing havoc and doing as much bloodshed as possible. And what about the Muslim Brotherhood you, you were mentioning? Yeah, I'll, I'll come to that. But if you see, 
over the last 10 years, Sheikh Hasina's zero tolerance policy had broken the backbone of all the traditional terrorist networks. But in 2016, when the Holy Artisan uh, Bakery attack happened, mm -hmm. Bangladesh woke up to a new reality that the, the threat is evolving. You had this different perception of uh, who would usually be the targets of extremist groups, for example, those who studied in madrasas or seminaries. But now, after 2016, we know that even uh, people who studied in English medium background schools or even in private universities can be the target of this. So you have online um, influencing of um, uh, youth who are getting radicalized. So these forms of new threats, uh, she's now fighting these new kind of new threats. And if you ask me very honestly, is there anyone else who can do that fight? I don't think so. Uh, about Muslim Brotherhood, Bangladesh has one uh, particular political organization which calls itself political, but it is much more of an extremist organization, Jamaat Islami. It is aligned to the Muslim Brotherhood, but it is even a much more it is a much more mutated form of Muslim Brotherhood. So Jamaat Islami, as you perhaps might know, were involved in war crimes, crimes against humanity, genocide in during Bangladesh's liberation war in 1971. They were banned for the first four years of Bangladesh's independence. In 1975, when the father of the nation was killed with almost his entire family, and only Sheikh Hasina and her younger daughter, Sheikh, uh, younger sister Sheikh Rehana, uh, survived the attack because they were abroad. After 1975, Jamaat -e Islami and the other communal political parties who willingly um, participated in the Pakistan Army's genocide campaign were given a new lease of life by BNP's founder, General Zia Rahman, Bangladesh's first military ruler, who um, rehabilitated these parties, gave them positions in the government, and they had never looked back. So they played a very big role during the military regimes in the, in the criminalization of Bangladesh's politics. Jamaat's student wing, Shibir, mm -hmm. is known to be one of the most uh, active non-state armed groups in the world. In 2013, in IHA's Jain's uh, index of uh, insurgency attacks, it came out third. So they never uh, stopped being what they were in 1971. Their signature move during the 80s and 90s was slitting the tendons of the arms and legs of their political opponents, usually progressive student organizations and associations. So anyone they considered a threat, they went after them with violence. We saw a new form of their power when PNP took them under their wing mm -hmm. in 2001 and made several of their uh, leaders ministers in their cabinet. 2001, you may also remember, as being one of the worst years for minority violence in Bangladesh. So right after the election, uh, you had hundreds of Hindus getting killed. There were over hundreds, uh, there were over 100 cases, reported uh, cases of rape of Hindu women at the hands of BNP and Jamaat activists. And uh, throughout 2001 to 2006, the five years of the BNP Jamaat tenure of government, this continued. Um, thousands of cases of minority repression, attacks on temples continued. Mm -hmm. And uh, after 2006, when the military back caretaker government came, of course, uh, Sheikh Hasina, along with Khalazia, were both arrested. Uh, Sheikh Hasina, uh, then in 2008, came out of jail, um, contested the election and won with a landslide. And then she took the fight to this extremist group, including Jamaat Islami, because in her political um, manifesto, she promised that she would hold trials of the war crimes of 1971. Which was done. Yes. Could you tell us something about uh, the work that your think tank has been doing amongst Bangladeshi youth to check radicalization? So firstly, what we mainly do with the youth is we give them a platform to talk. Mm -hmm. We always feel that one of the reasons why youth may feel disillusioned or disadvantaged is that they think that they're not getting a platform to raise their voice. So what we have done over the last uh, five and a half years is we have created a lot of platforms where the youths can come and raise their concerns about any issues, no holes barred. So no topic is off the uh, table, no uh, issue is of the discussion. So we have this program called Let's Talk, where we invite uh, different groups of youths to come and talk to the politicians directly and hold them accountable. So it was a very unique uh, thing for uh, Bangladeshi society where 
you know, in the subcontinental culture, you have political leaders talking in big dioceses, in big rallies, they just give their speeches and go home, and people clap, but not in our programs. In our programs, we make them listen to what the youth have, say, have to say and also answer their questions. So was this the brainchild of Sheikh Hasina's son, Sajib Bajit? This was, of course, um, uh, Sajib Wajid was part of it, but uh, one of our trustees is Mr. Radwan Mujib Siddiq. He is the uh, uh, nephew of the Prime Minister and he's the uh, son of Sheikh Rihanna, uh, the Prime Minister's um, younger sister. He is the uh, driving force behind initiatives like this. And we also have this youth platform called the Young Bangla, which is one of the largest youth platforms in Bangladesh now. What we do is we go throughout the country and find out the youth who are doing the best work, usually who don't get the media exposure, who don't get the attention that they deserve because they live in distant geographical locations. We identify them, we give them an award called the Joy Bangla Youth Award. Uh, we have been, we had three installments of this award so far. And after the award, we sort of take them into our fold, into a sort of a fellowship where we give them support, non-financial of course, support of making linkages with them and private enterprises, give them job trainings, uh, give them support uh, in the form of communications with the government relevant agencies. So through Young Bangla, we have been able to connect hundreds of thousands of youth so far, and hundreds of youth organizations now work with us. And through them, of course, we, we have a political ideology. We are not associated with the party. On paper and legally, we are an independent organization, and uh, we, we like to maintain that independence. But on an ideological level, we do have an ideology, and that ideology is the founding principles of Bangladesh. And these young people you're reaching out to, they seem to be those who probably belong to poorer families, but a large number of Bangladeshi youth from the urban middle class being drawn towards radicalization. How do you check that? Well, that is something where I think a lot of us have to come together. This is something where the government or the non-government sector cannot work in isolation. It has to be a very concerted effort. But I, I, would, not, I would not think that the number is that much high. Uh, sometimes when a, an incident like the Holy Artisan Bakery occurs, mm -hmm. uh, it uh, kind of uh, dilutes our perception. I don't think the number of radicalization among the youth of Bangladesh is that much high. Bangladesh is still at its core a very non-communal country. It's a very secular country. It is a country where the people take their religion seriously, but it is not a, a, a idea of faith which d is divisive. So yes, there are, there are portions of the population which have hold a fundamentalist view, but even within that fundamentalist view, there is space to listen to the views of others. So I don't think we have reached a tipping point in that regard, or there is something to be overtly uh, worried about, okay. but it is, of course, something that we need to be concerned about. We don't want another repetition of what happened on 1st July 2016. Uh, so what there are many organizations in Bangladesh that I know of we do not do any particular um, uh, preventing violent extremism, PV sort of work directly. Mm -hmm. What we try to do is what we try to connect organizations to the youth who are actually doing that work. So uh, we work with the organization called Save and Serve Foundation, mm -hmm. which is trying to um, bring youth of different faith um, from the urban as well as from the rural areas and let them talk about issues of their faith in order to build interfaith harmony. So this is an example of how we try to connect uh, different youth organizations and youth with the correct people so that the correct message is sent out. You have a lot of international organizations also working in this area, but it is, as I said, it is not something that, uh, it is not something which can be done alone by any particular sector on their own. It has to be a very collaborative effort. Yes, it was a pleasure talking to you, Farhad. Thanks very much. Thank you very much for having me.